Greetings in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to the worship service of Jefferson Presbyterian Church, Jefferson, Georgia. My name is Paul Evans and I'm blessed to be the pastor of this caring, faithful congregation and joining me once again are our keyboardist, Sylvia McDonald and our videographer, Kathy Marquez. We are so pleased to be able to bring this recorded service into your homes or into the places where you may be viewing it this morning or today. Thank you for being a part of our church family today. Although we can't see one another, we know that we're bound together by the Holy Spirit and we know that God is not limited by space or time. So as we worship together, may God bless you. May God bless us all richly. If you wish to rewatch the service or commit it to someone else, please know that you can go to our Facebook page, Jefferson Presbyterian Church, and find the link there. Or you can access the service by going directly to youtube.com and searching for Jefferson Presbyterian Church, Jefferson, Georgia. Here at our congregation, we always begin our time of worship with a time of greeting, a time of passing the peace of Christ. We're continuing that tradition despite the lack of a physical congregation. And so I invite each of you, wherever you are, to take a brief moment and turn to those about you and offer the words, the peace of Christ be with you. And as you do that, you're invited to respond as others greet you with the words and also with you. And if you happen to be worshiping today by yourself, please think of loved ones, family, friends, part of our church family here that you would like to greet even from afar, knowing that God hears that and by the Spirit's power, others will too. So sisters and brothers, the peace of Christ be with you. and also with you. Let us now pre prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of Almighty God as Sylvia leads us with the prelude.
Sisters and brothers, let us be called to worship with these words from the psalmist. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with singing. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountain are his also. The sea is his, for he made it and the dry land, which his hands have formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Let us pray. Almighty God, your power and strength are beyond anything we can imagine. You hold the whole world in your hands and yet clasp the delicate butterfly in your palms as well. As we worship this day, grant us a clearer, deeper glimpse of your greatness. May such a vision deepen our faith as we learn all the more that there is nothing beyond your ability to do. May your might and majesty humble us as we gather in your presence because you and you alone are God. Amen. Through music and through words, we've acknowledged who God is. Now it's our turn to acknowledge who we are, God's creatures, the sheep of his fold, flawed yet forgiven. In the confidence that we belong to God, let us make our prayer of confession to God and in the presence spiritually with one another. Let us pray. Sovereign God, we confess we've often given idols power over us, the idols of power and wealth, fame and security. We confess we've fallen into the ways of the world and have forgotten our identity in Christ. We've lost sight of your kingdom here on earth and instead have allowed the idols of the world to rule over us. Forgive us and restore us, O oh God, and hear us now as we make our own personal prayer of confession.
In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, hear and believe the good news as it also comes from the psalmist who declares, Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call on me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. I declare, therefore, in the authority of Jesus Christ, you and I, we all are forgiven. In the confidence that we believe that God is more willing and ready to hear us than we are to pray, we go before God now in prayer. Please join me in that spirit. As we gather and worship again, O oh God, we praise you for the power you have to bring us together in the spirit and also to sustain us when we're apart. If we're honest, we know that we have no idea of how powerful, how mighty you really are. You spoke creation into being with a word, a feat that is beyond our comprehension. And yet you pause to speak many words to us and listen to our words as well. We praise you that you're not a God who creates and then walks away, letting life and history run its course until you deem it wise to bring it to an end. Rather, you're intimately involved with your creation, and especially for us, when you are blessed to bear the name of Jesus. We worship you, Lord God, as Lord and Master, as sovereign ruler of all. But if we look with only our eyes and hear only with our ears, we're confronted with a world seemingly coming unglued. Yet through the eyes of faith and the heart of faith, we know that you are indeed in control and we take comfort and solace knowing that neither evil nor death will have the final word. Therefore, Lord God, enable us to live confidently in the knowledge that we belong to you and that nothing can ever separate us. Be with those who are under great duress now, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Bring your healing touch upon them. Bless those charged with such crucial decisions, such as when and how to return our children, youth, and young adults to school. Bless those laboring to find a vaccine for COVID-19 and those who continue to work to combat this vicious illness. In the midst of all the chaos, may we know and may we live in the peace that your loving and watchful eyes are ever upon each of us in every moment and that the world remains firmly in your mighty and merciful hands. These things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus, who teaches us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We all know that we have been richly blessed, but not simply for our own use, but as a means of blessing others. What God has given us, we can extend in ways that God will use to change the lives of others. Let us bless others as well as blessing the name of our Lord as we share in the offering this morning.
Let us pray together. In deep gratitude for all that you've done for us, O oh God, we offer ourselves and our gifts to you as living sacrifices of worship and praise. Transform our hearts and minds from the inside out. Show us what is good and pleasing in your sight so that we may be quick to recognize your call and quick to respond. In the name of Jesus, our Messiah and Lord. Amen. Family of Faith, today marks the second sermon in a series of sermons about the Hebrew names for God. There are probably over 200 names or descriptions of God, but don't worry, we're not going to do all of them by any stretch of your imagination. But today's sermon will be based out of Scripture coming out of Genesis 14 selected verses. Let us pray together. Once again, O oh God, grant us ears to hear, minds will understand, and hearts that will joyfully and faithfully follow Jesus wherever he leads us. Amen. Many, many years ago, when I was a Boy Scout, I went to scout camp every summer for a number of years. At Camp Kickapoo, that was the name of our camp, one of the first things that occurred at each week-long session was a lecture about, of all things, Coca-Cola. You see, it was blazing hot during the summertime, and water had not yet been bottled and made available. To assuage our thirst, we scouts would visit the Coca-Cola machine early and often. It was only five cents a bottle in those days, so it was a bargain. The problem was, however, that we scouts tended to discard those empty Coke bottles all over the camp rather than put them back on the rack where they belong. We scouts knew better, of course, but we were teenagers and you know how teenagers tend to be. Each summer, a scout counselor would tell us that one day archeologists would excavate the area and they would find many of these glass bottles buried underground but still well preserved. Not knowing about Coca-Cola in those days, they would assume that these were objects of worship. There were idols that people worshiped centuries ago. The great God, Coca-Cola. They would tell us that so we would not mislead the archeologists in their work or make others think that we were pagans. We were told that we needed to put our empty bottles back on the Coke racks so they could go back to the bottler and be reused. Some years ago, there was actually a comedy made about such a subject entitled, The Gods Must Be Crazy. Perhaps you've seen it. It was based on the idea of a soft drink bottle being found by a group of natives and worshiped as a god. You see, cultures have seemingly always had gods of some sort and they've had idols representing those gods as well, often idols no larger than a Coca-Cola bottle. Although the gods would have been envisioned as being much larger, however, the fact that even in these cultures, their gods were not that big. They were quite small. For you see, in those cultures, there was never seemingly an overarching god, one who could do everything, but rather they had many gods with various needs to serve the people. It was a fertility God for crops and for people, a rain or storm God for the weather, a God of war to ensure victory and so on. And so in the Old Testament, the pagan cultures represented there often functioned in this way using a concept of multiple gods, or as we say, they worship polytheistically. Abraham and Sarah responded to a call that they understood to be given by the name of a God called Adonai. This occurred while they were living in the polytheistic culture and city-state of Ur in Mesopotamia. They came to know and to follow this God, Adonai, who summoned them on a journey to a land of promise. 
The name Adonai is actually plural and it means Lord or master when referring to God, but it also in its plurality reveals the divine revelation of the Trinity, which of course Abraham and Sarah would not have understood in those days. Yet they remained obedient to Adonai. Adonai is probably the most frequently used name for God in the Bible, and it's used in both the Old and New Testaments. It's used over 400 times, in fact. In our text for today, the 14th chapter of Genesis, Abraham and Sarah have settled down, having separated from Abraham's nephew, Lot, and Lot's family. Unfortunately, Lot's choice for a place to live was not a wise one, and he and his family got caught up and a civil conflict between rival kings. They were captured and taken away along with all of their possessions. And when Abraham heard about this, he assembled 318 of his servants, servants that were there to protect him and his family. And they traveled 240 miles to attempt a rescue. With only a small group of men and seemingly against all odds, Abraham and his servants prevailed. Lot and his family were rescued along with their possessions. But along the way back, Abraham was met by two kings, Bera, the king of Sodom, whose people he had also rescued, and the mysterious king Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, Salem being an early version of the city of Jerusalem. While Bera tried to reward Abraham for his efforts and attempt to win his favor, Melchizedek instead brought forth some bread and wine in recognition of the remarkable event that had recently taken place. And Melchizedek then pronounced a benediction, a blessing upon Abraham with these words. Of course, at this point, Abraham's name was still Abram. It had not yet been changed. And so Melchizedek speaks to him and says, Blessed be Abram by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. In turn, we're told that Abraham gave Melchizedek one-tenth of everything that he had. Here we have an introduction to a new name for God, a name that is wonderfully mysterious, just as mysterious as the character Melchizedek is. The name is El Elyon, which you just heard translated from those words from Genesis as meaning God Most High. What is fascinating about this encounter is that Melchizedek is a Canaanite king and priest and yet apparently worships the same God as Abraham, though by a different name. What is further interesting is that in the letter to the Hebrews, we learn that Jesus' role as a priest comes from the order of Melchizedek and not from the order of Aaron, Moses' brother. Furthermore, Melchizedek is seen to be superior to Abraham by virtue of the fact that that Melchizedek blesses him and receives a tithe from him. All of this is to say, brothers and sisters, that what occurred at that moment was one of the most important events in all of Scripture. And so beginning here, Adonai, the God of Abraham and Sarah, will become known also by the name of El El Yon. Both Abraham and Melchizedek see their God as the creator of the heavens and the earth, and therefore one who rules with total supremacy over all that is. This name, El Elyon, is used 31 times in the Old Testament, mainly in the Psalms. And its Aramaic equivalent is used 10 times in the book of Daniel. In Psalm 91, we read, you who live in the shelter of the Most High, or El Elyon, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. 
Its Greek counterpart comes up in the New Testament. For example, when Gabriel prophesies to Mary about Jesus saying, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Gabriel also said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the son of God. God, El El Yon. It's not a name that will be forgotten over time, but it will emerge from time to time in the gospels as well as in other places in scripture. But some may see this as a rather insignificant name for God, but it's really critically important for us to understand it, to know more about who God is. As L.L. El Yon, we're reminded that God is not just the creator of the heaven and earth, nor is God merely a mighty God, but rather God as L.L. El Yon is supremely the sovereign ruler over everything. As such, God answers to no one and is in supreme authority in all matters, great and small. The Wycliffe Bible Translators, one of the great missionary organizations, they work to spread the good news over all of the earth. As of last year, they had translated the full Bible into 698 languages. The New Testament itself has been translated into an additional 1,548 languages and portions of the Bible and Bible stories into another 1,138 languages. Through the years, I've had a number of friends associated with Wycliffe who have given themselves to getting the Word of God out to people that otherwise would have never heard it. Two of those faithful missionaries are people that I read about recently, Bruce and Jan Benson, who served in Peru. One day, and it was about 15 years ago or so, I think, they were driving along a mountain road in the Andes. And we came to a switchback. They were confronted with a big truck that was loaded with armed men. These men were members of a brutal terrorist organization. Perhaps you remember hearing about it. It was called Shining Path. These men took Bruce, Jan, and their 14-year-old son into hostage, and they took them to a nearby town. Jan said she was sure that soon the three of them would be dead. And so in the midst of this, Jan said she began to pray and even sing. She sang songs that you and I know like, you are my hiding place and the old hymn, trust and obey and the song, Jesus name above all names. And she began to remember Bible verses and began to repeat them to herself. And she said, as she did, a great calm came over her and she sensed a reassurance from God that everything was going to be okay, that God was in complete control and nothing could take her away from God, not even death. Surprisingly, these men ended up releasing these three, but not before confiscating their vehicle and the equipment that was in it. You see, they had a film projector and several copies of a Christian movie depicting the Gospel of Luke telling the story of Jesus. It came from the Jesus Film Project, a project you may be familiar with. After their release, the Bensons moved to Lima, Peru, the capital city for safety, and they took on some administrative work there instead of working in the field. But one day, while in the office, Jan received a phone call, an intriguing one. One of their captors had become a Christian and wanted to meet them. And so they gathered one day face to face and he told them the story about how they had planned to kill all three of them, but for some reason they could not do it. Interestingly, he said that when he and his terrorist buddies returned to their camp, they set up the film projector and began showing whatever was on the film reels. They began watching story about Jesus and the gospel of Luke. 
The movie was in their native language too, so they could understand every word. He said the men, many of them were so moved by what they heard and saw, they wanted to put down their weapons and leave. He said he became a believer and he wanted to see them and meet them. And he wanted also to ask them for their forgiveness. One of the scriptures that Jan recalled during her abduction was Psalm 92, which begins, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, that is El El Yon. To declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp and the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your works. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Sisters and brothers, you and I are not likely to experience the trauma that the Bensons encountered, but we do encounter situations from time to time that make us pause and wonder, is God really the God most high? Is God really in control? What then does El El Yon mean for us? It simply means that God is God and there is no other. There are no small gods of fertility, weather, or war, only God. There are no small gods of wealth, sex, athletics, or fame, only God. God revealed first to Abraham as El Elyon, God most high. El Elyon is the God who does what God pleases, when God pleases, how God pleases, to whom God pleases, where God pleases, and how God pleases. In the midst of a world that seems to be a situation where evil is winning the day, where disease continues to be rampant and where our own culture is filled with dissension, we who have given ourselves to Adonai, the one who is Lord and Master, Jesus, must also take confidence in giving ourselves to the one who is supremely and sovereignly God, God the Most High. Worshiping anyone or anything else is not worshiping God. Worshiping anyone or anything else less than El El Yon is idolatry. Eugene Peterson, the, the late Presbyterian minister and uh, author, wrote these words. Everyone has a hunger for God, one that is deep and insatiable. What most lack is a desire. For both Christians and non-Christians, what we really want is to become our own God so we may do what we want and have other gods around us to help us in that way, to make it that way. We want to be comfortable, content. In so doing though, brothers and sisters, we can find ourselves making God into our own image. It's been said that small gods make big idols. But anything less than God Most High or El El Yon is a God far, far too small. Anything less than the Son of the Most High God is a God too small. My hope and prayer is that during this sermon series that we will discover in fresh ways the meaning of the various names of God and that these names will make us more aware of who God really is and what God does. Peterson went on also to write that the United States is the leading producer of golden calves. Indeed, idolatry is around us and among us as never before. But family of faith, those are small gods. Only El El Yon can be God. There can be no others. May God, our El El Yon, God most high, reveal to us through his son and open our eyes and hearts to his might and goodness, his mercy and majesty and all the greatness that makes God the sovereign ruler of both heaven and earth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
faith, our worship has ended here. But the service of worship continues as you and I go out into the world. As we prepare to do that, let us reaffirm our congregational covenant with God and with one another. As we say together with one voice, I go into the world with the faith of Jesus to love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love my neighbor as myself, and to do the good works of righteousness. And as we go, be ever mindful that God uses what we have to fill a need which we never could have filled, that God uses where we are to take us where we never could have gone, that God uses what we can do to accomplish what we never could have done, that God uses who you are to let you become who you never could have been. May God Most High, El El Yon, be with you and abide with you this day. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ reign in your hearts. And all God's people said, Amen. Hi, Jefferson Presbyterian Church family. It's the Marquis family. We're going to try to give you an update of what we've done since we saw you last. We got to finish school online. Leah, Leah finished the 10th grade. Ava finished the 5th grade. Will finished the 3rd grade. And John finished the 8th grade. Um, Steve and I have been able to work pretty much through the whole thing without stopping. Um, for two weeks. Yeah, except for the two weeks where we all had COVID. Um, so that was really fun. Um, fortunately, none of us were symptomatic except for Stephen, who was pretty yucky, and Leah, who lost her taste and smell. Dad? Yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting summer. Um, I do want to thank all the church family for all the prayers and everything, um, as we lost my dad and, grand and their grandfather in April. Uh, yeah. We will have his service coming up in uh, I think August 8th, um, but it's been an active summer. Leah got her driver's license as well. New uh, driver. New driver and a new car. Be aware. And of course, Bella's already here with us. She doesn't leave us when we're home. So she, she jumped in the, the video with us. Yeah. Um, Ava has fifth grade. Um, sixth grade. No, she's got fifth grade. They're gonna have a drive-through celebration That's next fine. week to um, celebrate the end of fifth grade and going to middle school and being a part of the STEAM team. Um, John, why don't you tell them about band and band practice? We are right in the middle of band camp after filming this. Yeah, this is John's first band camp. What instrument you playing? Baritone, euphonium, euphonium. Euphonium. So John's going to the high school, Ava's going to the middle school. Leaving John in elementary no, school. Well, <laughs> this one in elementary school for another year or two, um, and that's but pretty much. And that's pretty much it. We've been, it's been um, been a different summer, but um, I've been lucky that I've gotten to continue to go to church and hear Paul's sermons in person. So you know, don't hate. So, but um, it has been really fun and a learning experience, learning how to bring the sermons online. So, um, we look forward to the time when we're back all together. And until then, we'll see you every Sunday online. All right, bye. Bye. bye.